this is a chance to um, talk a little bit about the vaccines that we have available at this point for um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, and to try to get all your questions answered. I thought I would start with um, some presentation so that um, we can cover the most common uh, things that people are concerned about or the most common questions, and then um, leave things open for uh, questions. And um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I guess I, I don't usually do a, a disclaimer about um, no financial conflicts of interest, but I have none here. I've not uh, worked for um, pharmaceutical companies or uh, worked for the vaccine industry. I don't get paid by um, the vaccine manufacturers. And we're gonna be talking about the science and what we know and don't know about these vaccines and um, this is not uh, a commercial for uh, for the vaccines. So I'm not going to go over this in detail but uh, I included this uh, slide just to remind you if you didn't know there are lots of vaccines that are being developed. Um, if you followed this news at all you know that Moderna and Pfizer were the first two approved and the J&J &J vaccine was just approved um, this last weekend and the uh, ACIP, the group that advises the CDC, is meeting yet today to sort of finalize the CDC's recommendations about the use of the vaccine. Um, the first two were these mRNA vaccines. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit more about the J&J um, &J, uh, adenovirus uh, vaccine as we go through, but there are um, other vaccines that are getting a lot of attention, um, like the AstraZeneca or Oxford vaccine, um, and that's already being used a number of places in the world. And they're ones that are coming fairly close behind like the Novavax vaccine. And I just wanna start by um, framing your thinking about these vaccines with this Swiss cheese model. And, um, uh, you know, maybe it would be better to think about uh, this model as uh, stainless steel plates with holes in them rather than Swiss cheese and uh, think of them as, uh, uh, you know, trying to get a bullet to get through all the rather than thinking about viruses wafting through these holes. But in any event, there are um, some things that you can do for yourself to protect yourself from getting COVID-19. And there are other things that we kind of all have to do together if we're gonna stop the spread of this virus. And so you certainly have heard things like staying home if you're sick, washing your hands, wearing masks, don't touch your face and so forth. And those are all things you can and will wanna do to limit your risk of infection. Um, but among the shared responsibilities of vaccines is probably one of the most important ones because um, the immunity that a, a person gets from the vaccine not only protects them, but will help protect other people uh, in their community, specifically their friends and family, the people they spend the most time with. Um, I also wanted to give this slide as a background. Um, I don't know who's all on the call. I certainly don't know your ages, but you can look at this table and get an idea of what your uh, risk of dying of this infection is. So, uh, you know, we do have healthcare workers who are under the age of 30, and it's about one in 20,000 chance that if you get this infection, you're gonna die. It's very, very low. Um, but as you go up through the different age groups, you can see that once you get over age 65, and we have healthcare workers and others that are over um, 65, that number goes up to one in 43. So um, overall, that infection fatality ratio um, may be something like a quarter of 1% for people who are not in nursing homes. It's relatively low. And um, you know, you'll hear people um, uh, disparaging the virus by saying, you know, more than 99% of people don't even die from this virus. And that is true, but um, that's the overall number. And if you're over 65, clearly your risk of dying is um, far greater than uh, 1% or a fraction of 1%. So why should you get vaccinated? Um, as I've said, it'll protect you and will help protect your family and keep others in the community safe. And it's really our best chance at bringing this um, epidemic to a close and uh, getting back to more uh, 
normal conditions. And um, from my perspective, I think this summarizes it well, that uh, vaccination is a voluntary common sense public health measure. So I think the first question that people uh, tend to ask about these vaccines are, are they safe? And when people develop vaccines, really this is the primary thing they're looking for is a safe vaccine because even if um, a vaccine will prevent disease, if it's not safe, it's not gonna be widely used and widely adopted. And um, what we know from lots of other vaccines and from what we've seen um, with uh, these kinds of viral infections um, is that if people are gonna have uh, symptoms or side effects, they tend to occur relatively quickly after vaccination usually in the first six weeks. And so they built in an extra layer of safety with uh, the monitoring of these vaccines by requiring eight weeks of safety follow-up before the data could be submitted to the FDA. And obviously they're continuing to monitor the safety of these vaccines going forward. So we have much longer periods of follow-up now than even the eight weeks. Um, Usually when um, people are doing vaccine clinical trials, they include a minimum of 3000 people in those trials. In this case, um, basically the trials are much, much larger on the order of 30 to 50,000 participants. And while I understand lots of people don't wanna be the first in line to get these vaccines, we now are up over 70 million doses of the first two vaccines that have been administered in the United States and more than 236 million doses worldwide. So millions and millions of people now have been vaccinated with these vaccines and they continue to appear to be safe. Um, this slide um, talks about the protection of the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. They're both pretty close to 95% um, when measured about preventing um, infection. The um, J&J &J or Janssen vaccine that was just approved last week has a lower uh, percentage effectiveness number at roughly 67%. But the thing that is impressive about that vaccine and is important and why um, people I think are generally thinking about this similar to the other two vaccines is that um, they had no cases of hospitalization or death after day 28. So after people's immune system had enough time to, um, to recognize the vaccine and develop a response to it, uh, it appeared to prevent um, hospitalization and death in um, the people that got the vaccine, even if only two out of three were altogether prevented from getting infected. Um, these vaccines were studied in diverse groups of people. They weren't just all um, old white men. Um, the Pfizer vaccine was about 30% racially diverse. Moderna was 37%. Um, the J&J &J vaccine um, had 17% black enrollees and a much larger percentage of Hispanic enrollees. And all of these have been used both in, in younger people as well as older people. Um, one of the misfortunes about um, the government operation that um, helped further the development of these vaccines is that they named it Operation Warp Speed. And so I think that could leave uh, people with the impression that um, things were done uh, too quickly. But in reality, none of the safety steps that are used to develop safe vaccines were skipped in the development of these products. And um, really the, the way they sped the development of these along was by putting the manufacturing at risk. You could sort of, um, you know, imagine this like um, manufacturing millions and millions of baby Yodas before the last Star Wars movie comes out. And you don't know for sure that the movie's gonna be a hit or that people are gonna be interested in baby Yoda. And you risk um, having to throw out a lot of what you've manufactured if it doesn't work out the way you intend it to. But, um, the vaccines weren't rushed in terms of the safety steps in um, creating the vaccines. The other thing you should know about the development of these vaccines is that um, there are independent groups, specifically one at the FDA or that works with the FDA and one at 
the CDC or that works independently, but with the CDC, that look at all the data and the safety um, signals from these vaccines in order to determine whether they should be used or not. So it's not like um, the board of directors of a pharmaceutical company decides whether or not these are gonna make it on the market and be used. They're independent groups that don't work for um, the pharmaceutical companies that make these decisions. It, they do get labeled with an emergency use authorization. And basically that's just a step um, to speed the um, implementation of the vaccines once they've been determined to be safe. Um, because like right now we have a couple thousand that had been more than 3000 people dying a day. So if you think about an epidemic that's killing 3000 people a day, if you waited a year to, um, to see what people's immunity was like after they were vaccinated, before you let anybody else get the vaccine, you could be talking about another half million or a million people who would die while we're waiting on these vaccines to be made available. So just because um, uh, it's called an emergency use authorization, it doesn't mean that um, it's an unsafe vaccine. Um, and there will be the possibility or the potential once people have been followed for longer periods of time for the companies to go back and apply for um, licensure of the vaccine. And I expect that that will, uh, will happen eventually. Um, so the major reasons that these vaccines were able to be developed as quickly as they were are that um, one, we had the world's leading scientists working on the vaccines because everybody knew that this was a serious problem for um, humans across the globe. Um, nearly unlimited resources in terms of the kind of investment um, knowledge and manpower and technology that were um, focused on developing the, these vaccines. And because um, people were worried about um, dying of these infections and wanted to see the pandemic end, we had lots of people volunteering for the clinical trials so that they could be enrolled very quickly and um, the studies could be conducted in a timely fashion. Um, and then finally, because there are so many cases of this, um, it was easier to prove that the vaccine worked in a, in a timely fashion. Um, if you have an Ebola vaccine, for example, and um, you start to vaccinate people to study the vaccine, and then all of the things that people are doing to stop the Ebola epidemic work, um, you could be in a situation where you have vaccine, but you don't have enough people to actually study the vaccine. And that was not the case with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, so the first three vaccines that are uh, available include the two mRNA vaccines, one from Pfizer and one from Moderna. And then this new J&J &J vaccine, which uses part of an adenovirus, which can't cause infection to basically shuttle the roadmap um, for the spike, spike protein into cells so that the cells um, express or create that protein and the body's immune system can mount a response against it. So in a way, all three of these vaccines are really um, focusing on a similar thing, the spike protein, sort of this outer part of the virus so that uh, your body uh, recognizes that uh, spike protein. But none of these uh, vaccines contain the actual COVID-19 virus. So you can't get a SARS-CoV-2 infection from these vaccines. It's just not, it's not possible. Now, the mRNA um, COVID vaccines, it is um, a relatively new um, uh, technology in that these are the first vaccines that have come on the market that use this technology. But in fact, the technology has been in development for a decade or more. And it's really like they got the assembly line ready to use this um, technology um, before the pandemic. And then they just plugged in um, the information from this particular virus in order to, um, to make the vaccine. And basically um, the cells, our cells, will respond to that mRNA by making a harmless piece um, that looks like this spike protein that our immune system then recognizes. Um, and then we 
develop antibodies, we develop T cells, T cell responses. We do all the things that the body normally does to develop an immune response. Um, but there's no way that you can get COVID-19 from the, from the vaccine. And because it's messenger RNA, it actually will not, um, it doesn't get into the nucleus. It doesn't become incorporated in your body. So it doesn't change uh, your body in a fundamental way. It allows your immune system to respond to that uh, spike protein. Um, most of the vaccines that are being developed are two-dose vaccines. Um, in the case of Pfizer and Moderna, the second dose is three or four weeks later. And generally, we expect that your protection will uh, be developed by two weeks after you receive your second dose. Now, the J&J vaccine, which just is approved, is the one that is a one-dose vaccine. And so, again, you'd expect you'd have immunity a couple weeks after you've been vaccinated. But even with that vaccine, there's a suggestion that your body will um, continue to amount an immune response for even longer. Now, one of the primary things we um, really do not know yet is how long the vaccines will be protective. Um, I do hear people who don't wanna get vaccinated without knowing that particular piece of information. But the reality is the virus has only been around for a little over a year. These vaccines only started getting studied less than a year ago. And so there isn't any way that it's possible to know how long the vaccines will work. Could be three months, I don't think so. I think it'll be longer than that. It could be a year, could be three years. Theoretically, it could be 30 years. We, ju we just don't know yet. And while I expect it's gonna be a year or more, um, it is possible that uh, we will need booster shots um, in the future at some point but it's just too early to, uh, to know that. So as I've said, you can't get um, COVID from the vaccine. The reality though, is that your body is mounting an immune response to that um, spike protein. And so some of the symptoms that you can have after vaccination are not entirely different than the symptoms you would get if you, um, if you got COVID. The fortunate thing about the vaccines is that typically these symptoms only last for a day or two um, or maybe even less. So for example, when I got my second dose of the vaccine, the following day, I thought to myself, you know, I, I feel like I could have a headache coming on. I feel like I'm more tired than I should be. And I feel like my muscles are maybe starting to ache. And I took a couple Tylenols and by a couple hours later, I'd forgotten all about it. So uh, it's not to say that you necessarily will get these symptoms or that they necessarily will last a day, but if you do get symptoms after the vaccine, it typically is just a day or two, and then you're gonna be over it. And it really is, um, it's a good indication that your immune system is responding to that vaccine. And these are um, short-lived side effects that are normal, common, and, um, and expected. Now, this is the slide that talks about the frequency of uh, the um, uh, symptoms that people get after they get vaccinated. And I've included data from uh, Pfizer. And then I added these J&J &J, um, numbers uh, to the right here. Um, fever has been four to 16%, very similar for the J&J &J vaccine. Fatigue was 34 to 59%. Again, not, not terribly dissimilar for the J&J &J vaccine. Headache um, from a quarter to a half of people, um, the J&J &J vaccine was in that same range. And then muscle pain from 14 to 37% and pretty similar uh, ranges for the J&J &J vaccine. Um, the thing that we've seen with the vaccines is that uh, if you're getting a two-dose vaccine, it does tend to be the um, second dose where people have more symptoms. And also this is one of the few situations where being older is to your advantage because older folks tend to have less symptoms than younger folks do. So um, the other thing I included on this slide is I did just include the, um, the placebo arm and I just chose from the J&J &J study, but it, it's not terribly dissimilar for um, the other uh, vaccines as well. So when you look at 
at something and say, well, four to 16% of people have fever, it's worth always comparing it to the number of people who got placebo and had a fever. So like, I believe the vaccines can cause fever because only 1% of the placebo group had fever and these are significantly higher. But interesting, if, if you look at like fatigue, it's actually over 20% of people that got placebo felt fatigue. So um, this kind of a 34% number may feel kind of high to you, but it's maybe only um, you know 12% higher than um, what was happening in the placebo group. Likewise, headache, it was about a quarter of people um, in the placebo group that had headaches. And um, that's at the low end of what we saw in the vaccine group. So it just says that headaches are a very common symptom. People get headaches for lots of reasons and not everything that happens after a vaccine is, is from the vaccine. And then muscle pain um, and I, is one of the ones where um, actually older folks had higher rates of muscle pain than younger folks. Um, but again, the muscle pain was pretty similar at the low end um, of uh, the numbers to what was seen in the placebo group. So um, one of the other questions that comes up is whether it's safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine if you've had COVID-19, um, and it is. Um, it does, we, we have growing evidence that actually, um, particularly for the two dose vaccines that if you have had COVID and you just get one dose of the vaccine, that your immunity actually looks pretty similar to people that have gotten um, two doses of the vaccine. It's still recommended you get two doses, but that's um, reassuring that people get a good um, immune response, even if they've had uh, COVID before. Um, we don't have absolute firm evidence at this point um, about the vaccine compared to natural infection, but the suggestion um, certainly has been that people get better immunity um, from the vaccine than they get from, um, from natural infection, particularly if you've had mild um, infection to begin with. Um, even if you have antibodies, you can get vaccinated. And the other thing that's come up a lot has been questions around pregnancy. And um, while the, the um, drugs weren't initially studied in pregnant women, um, there have been more than 10,000 pregnant women vaccinated so far, and that hasn't raised any concerns or safety signals from, from those patients or those people that have been vaccinated. And while 10,000 isn't 62 million, it's a fairly good sized number. And so far uh, the vaccine's been appearing safe. Um, if you're looking for additional information, I would encourage you to go to the CDC website or the Indiana Department of Health website and don't just go to random social media sites. There is more misinformation on social media than it's possible for anybody to uh, keep up with and correct um, because people can just keep making up wild theories and putting them out there um, to confuse people um, faster than you can even um, answer all those. So um, these are the uh, I think the most effective way we have in terms of that Swiss cheese model in interrupting transmission and interrupting the pandemic. And um, so I would encourage folks to get vaccinated because um, you know, from a, a practical standpoint, we don't wanna be um, doing social distancing for the rest of our lives. We don't wanna be wearing masks for the rest of our lives. And this is the way we're gonna slow down this uh, this pandemic and bring it under control. Um, the reality is that everybody gets a vote in this epidemic and um, you're either gonna have to vote for getting the vaccine or you're gonna have to vote for trying your luck with the coronavirus. I don't anticipate that uh, there's anybody who can just through willpower and being careful um, is likely to keep themselves from getting the coronavirus um, over the uh, over the next few years, unless you uh, you don't work, you live in a house by yourself, and somebody else is going to do all your shopping for you and bring the food and drop it at your doorstep, and you're never going to have to leave your building. Um, you're either going to have to choose to uh, to get vaccinated, or you're you'll choose to uh, at some point get infected with this virus. And um, I think the safer 
um, thing to do is to uh, get to get vaccinated. Um, I would point out that we have had um, over 300 of our colleagues that have gotten infected uh, with uh, COVID-19. It's not rare, um, even for the healthcare workers who are trying to take care of themselves to get infected with this virus. And I'd also point out that the majority of our um, healthcare workers have already gone ahead and gotten um, vaccinated. Um, if you look at the uh, medical staff, the physicians and nurse practitioners, it's actually over 95% are either vaccinated or in the process of getting vaccinated. So it, it is the majority of folks that are moving ahead to get, uh, to get vaccinated. Um, and I would encourage you to get vaccinated uh, also because um, people are gonna look to you as healthcare workers um, to see what kind of choices you are making and what you say about the vaccine and what you do about getting vaccinated is gonna help our community uh, make good choices about, um, about getting vaccinated as well. studies of people who've had COVID already then get vaccinated? And if so, what are the documented results and side effects? Um, there were people with COVID that were included in the vaccine clinical trials. Obviously, that wasn't the primary group of people they were trying to enroll in the trial, but there were um, sizable numbers of people who were um, in, the, in the clinical trials that had, had COVID already. And um, the vaccine also appears to be safe and effective in those folks. There is some suggestion that um, the reactogenicity or th those, those temporary short-lived side effects like muscle aches, fever, headache, and so forth um, may be a little bit more common in folks that have had um, COVID, particularly if um, they had it very recently. But um, the vaccine still appears safe and effective and um, we don't have great information about um, how long the immunity from natural infection with COVID lasts. So it seems in the overwhelming majority of folks to last at least 90 days. So I don't think it's a problem if you're concerned about um, those reactogenicity symptoms to wait till 90 days after you had COVID initially before you get vaccinated, but it is, it's safe to go ahead and get vaccinated earlier. And, um, and uh, so you certainly can do that, but I also don't think it's unreasonable to wait, to wait that 90 days, particularly in a situation where you already have immunity to this virus and there are lots of people waiting in line to get vaccinated. Um, what is the rationale for a vaccinated healthcare worker having to wear N95 in a COVID positive patient room? And could we save on PPE by just wearing a standard mask? So, um, good question. The, the vaccine appears to be, um, well, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines both appear to be about 95% effective. So the, um, the downside of that is that means in the real world, 
one out of 20 people are not going to be protected um, even after they've been vaccinated. So even though in terms of the development of the, these vaccines and what we thought we might be able to do, it, this is a home run in terms of how effective these vaccines are. It's, it's not, they aren't perfect. And there will be this one in 20 uh, people that are not gonna be protected um, from getting sick from, um, from the virus. And so, um, you know, I know obviously it's a different pathogen, but when we've had patients with uh, tuberculosis, for example, in the past, if we had somebody in TB uh, with TB that was in the hospital and wasn't recognized, it would not be uncommon for us to have uh, 50 healthcare workers that took care of that patient during the course of their uh, stay in the hospital. And I don't know that that number would be quite as high for, um, for COVID-19 patients, but whether you said we'd have 20 people or 40 people, let's say we had 40 people uh, take care of an average patient during their stay in the hospital, that would still um, suggest that we would have had a couple of healthcare workers that would not have responded to their vaccine that would be in taking care of that patient. And so we still wanna protect healthcare workers because we don't know which those one or two people will be. And that's why I expect that we'll still be um, using N95s. It would be true that, you know, um, uh, surgical masks are cheaper than, than N95s, but um, we are primarily interested in protecting our healthcare workers uh, more than saving a buck. Um, are there any reasons a person should not get the vaccine? Well, the primary thing that's been of concern with, um, with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have actually been these allergic reactions. And you may have heard about these. Um, the good news is they're, they're what I would consider quite rare. Um, they, they're on the order of one in 100,000 people who get um, vaccinated will have an allergic or anaphylactic response to the vaccine. Um, we are, I think, close to 20,000 uh, doses of vaccine in our clinic that have been given, and we have not had any serious allergic reactions that have required um, epinephrine or any kind of treatment in the vaccine clinic. I, I heard about one person who had allergic manif manifestations um, quite a bit after they were vaccinated that it was unclear, could this have been the vaccine or could this have been something else the person was reacting to because they did have some history of allergic reactions to other things as well. Um, so um, all of those allergic reactions that have happened have been treatable. Um, nobody has died from those allergic reactions. And so if you measure you know, from that early slide, your risk of death from the virus versus um, a risk of uh, anaphylaxis at one in 100,000, which is not going to um, kill you, um, it, it still seems on balance that the risk benefit is definitely in favor of, uh, of vaccination. But if you have a history of allergies, then you can actually look at the, the things that are put into the vaccine um, and see if you're allergic to any of those um, components. And the primary things that people have had reactions to have been PEG, or polyethylene glycol, um, and polysorbates are something that are, are um, related to uh, polyethylene glycol. And um, you know, I don't know personally, like anybody who says I'm allergic to polyethylene glycol or polysorbates, but it it would be possible that you would know that about yourself. And if that was true, I I would suggest you steer clear of the of uh, the mRNA vaccines. But um, the pharmaceutical companies have detailed analysis of everything that's in the vaccines. And typically these vaccines are not, uh, don't have preservatives or adjuvants or some of the other things that people have typically been concerned about having allergic reactions to um, from, uh, from vaccines. Um, the, the other thing I guess I could put on that list, are there any reasons a person should not get the vaccine? Um, Currently, the recommendation around pregnancy and lactation is discuss it with your doctor. And um, that's because the vaccines really weren't studied in, in pregnant women, although they are being, the, like the Pfizer vaccines being studied now. I think they have a trial with like 10,000 um, 
you know, maybe it's 4,000 women uh, who are pregnant, who are, who are being studied. Um, because it's not studied in that group, um, and the same thing would hold for younger children, um, they aren't recommended in those groups. But um, like in pregnancy, it's clear that COVID-19 causes more uh, disease and more severe disease in pregnant women. And so I think you really do have to weigh the risks and benefits for an individual um, in deciding if and when to get vaccinated in pregnancy. If I was um, an ICU nurse or a four West nurse that was um, taking care of COVID patients on a regular basis and I was pregnant, um, uh, I, I would recommend going ahead and getting uh, vaccinated. Now, I guess this came up at one of the colleague meetings and people thought it was funny because uh, a man said if I was pregnant, but I, you know, if I put myself in, in the place of a woman who could be pregnant or is pregnant, um, I think the vaccines are safe enough and the disease is bad enough that it makes sense to get um, vaccinated. On the other hand, I, I have a family member who is um, pregnant, who has a job where she can work remotely and she doesn't really need to go out to the store or um, go out in public. It may make a lot more sense for her to, to wait on getting vaccinated and to just make sure she doesn't get the virus because she's in a position where um, she has more control over um, the kinds of exposures that she has. But I, I think the vaccine uh, will prove eventually to be safe in pregnancy and, um, and eventually that will be a recommendation for people who um, haven't been vaccinated before they get pregnant. Um, yeah, so I, I am an adult infectious disease doctor. I tend not to think quite as much about children. So I'm sorry if I ignored um, children in this discussion, but um, the current vaccines are not approved um, below age 16. Um, and while there are clinical trials ongoing in younger kids, um, they are still figuring out the dose and how the immune response goes in kids. So the, uh, children are not currently um, recommended to get the vaccine. Um, what if a person only gets the first vaccine and then misses the second? Do they still have some immunity and idea of what percentage? So um, like the J&J &J vaccine, it's a one dose vaccine. So all of the numbers about immunity that you see related to J&J &J will be based on that one dose. Um, the other two uh, vaccines, it does appear that they are, are quite good even with one dose. And that's why you've heard some um, uh, public health folks and epidemiologists suggest that we probably should just be vaccinating um, everybody with one dose um, while the vaccines are in short supply and then come back and vaccinate people with the second dose um, later. Um, and this um, becomes kind of a question about uh, how you think about science and so forth, because the science for these vaccines is all based around um, these large clinical trials that gave two doses. And so there, there is an actual rationale for why it might make sense to, um, to vaccinate the entire US population with one dose and then come back and do everybody else, uh, you, know, uh, you know, do everybody again with the second dose. Um, the, the downside of that is, um, is there is more uncertainty around how well a single dose works and for how long it works. Um, I would not be surprised if we find out that um, a single dose of the mRNA vaccines is, uh, you know, 70, 80, may, maybe higher protection um, against um, infection. Um, but I would really be surprised if it's as durable a, a response, that is it, that the immune response would last as long. And um, the other thing that's been raised as a concern is um, in terms of these variants or um, the new, um, versions of the virus that are developing, um, it's probably um, less likely to develop uh, strains of the virus that are different and that resist the immune response more effectively 
than the the variant that came out of China originally. If you've had two doses of the vaccine, um, compared if you've only had one dose, and while it's not exactly analogous to using uh, antibiotics, um, you, you can sort of uh, picture that if you gave you know the whole world um, a single dose of an antibiotic, that you'd be more likely to develop resistance than if only half the world um, got the same antibiotic and they got a significantly higher dose of that antibiotic. So um, at this point, the United States has taken the approach of uh, making sure we follow the clinical trial data and giving people the recommended number of doses. Other countries like um, uh, Great Britain have taken a different approach. And so we will probably have more information eventually about the pros and cons of doing it that way. Um, Uh, and I just scroll down to get the rest of that question. Um, so you don't need to start over if you had a delay in getting your second dose of vaccine. It is recommended that people get their second dose uh, on time. And if you can't get it on time, um, it's recommended that you do it within 42 days. But I would expect that you would still get a boost and that uh, you still should get vaccinated with that second dose. Um, is there a risk for long-term side effects? So, you know, that, this is why we do the clinical trials with, you know, 30 or 40,000 people to look for, um, for side effects. And people are being followed for longer uh, time periods than those eight weeks. But um, the, the risk at this point seems quite low uh, for long-term side effects. Um, you know, with any of these clinical trials, there can be imbalances in things that happen in the two groups. Um, Cause even if you randomize people um, to two groups, it doesn't mean that the two groups are made up of identical people. And so like uh, Bell's palsy was one of the concerns with one of the clinical trials early on, but you know, these now have been used in 60 million people and we're not seeing a lot of Bell's palsy in uh, people that are getting vaccinated. So that one seems to have been a fluke related to um, just the randomness of uh, what happens in, in clinical trials. Um, but we don't, we don't really have any signals of anything else that looks like a long-term side effect from the vaccine. Whereas we have very clear signals of long-term side effects from the disease where, um, you know, if you can, consider death a long-term side effect, or um, people have had to have double lung transplants. Um, there are people who are um, six months out and longer from their COVID infection that are still suffering from profound fatigue or whose lungs have not completely recovered, um, people that have had strokes and so forth. Um, so uh, nothing has been seen in terms of long-term side effects that is uh, even on the same scale as, um, as uh, what happens from the actual disease. Um, what's the best response to have when people say they don't wanna get the vaccine because it made people they know get sick? Um, well, I, I don't really know what the best response is. I, I think of the kinds of complaints I hear from uh, people about the flu vaccine over the years. And um, what I tell, uh, people is that, you know, the people who didn't get their flu vaccine and then died of influenza never come and complain to me about the side effects of the vaccine. Uh, people who um, get the vaccine and then get a case of influenza may complain to me for the next 20 or 40 years of their life, but they're alive to complain to me. And um, oftentimes the complaints are, I got the flu shot and then I got the flu anyway. Um, most important part of getting the flu shot is actually not um, whether or not you get the flu, it's the fact that you survive the flu. And so uh, the people that get their flu vaccine, get the flu, they live to complain for decades about their experience, but they live to complain about their experience. And um, so I, for me, um, 
you know, when people um, say they don't want to get the vaccine because it, it made them, they heard somebody else got sick, I would just say about my experience, which is the people I know who've gotten, gotten sick from the vaccine have uh, generally been sick for a day or two, maybe three days at the outside, but they, they recover and they're fine. Whereas the people I know, um, you know, we've had a hundred deaths at, at Goshen Hospital from COVID-19, a hundred people who are not gonna be around to complain about um, their temporary short-lived vaccine side effects because there was no vaccine to keep them alive. Um, I just think it's hands down, even, even if all you're interested in is living um, without thinking about um, you know, the strokes, the pulmonary emboli, the long-term pulmonary disability, the fatigue, the brain fog, the loss of taste and smell, all the other things that COVID does and uh, makes people sick. Um, you know, if, if, you, um, if you are concerned about getting, um, you know, micrograms of spike protein that make you feel sick for um, some number of hours, uh, I, I certainly would not wish on you the full viral infection. And the evidence we have is that this is a highly transmissible virus and um, it's gonna continue to spread in our community. Um, and, and people are gonna have all those uh, symptoms and side effects from the virus itself. Um, next question, what do you believe is the chance of, giving, of getting COVID-19 again after having it? Are there studies on reinfection? Well, so far it seems to be pretty rare that people get reinfected, but um, we certainly know from other coronaviruses that um, people do get reinfections. And it seems like um, with the other coronaviruses, uh, people get infected, maybe not every year, but um, maybe every few years that, that people get repeated infections over time. And so um, again, this is building on a, an analogy of one coronavirus to another, and that may not prove to be true, but I think there's a pretty good chance that people will, will get reinfected with, um, with this virus. Um, most of the suggestion we have to date is that people will get milder infections the second time they get infected rather than uh, more severe infections, but there have been individual reports where people got sicker the second time than the first time. Um, particularly if they had a very mild case the first time. Um, so in terms of the chance of getting infected again, I would say um, it is high, but it also, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that could be impacted by people's acceptance of the vaccine and how uh, quickly and how well we get vaccine uptake because, um, if you have a virus that is uh, circulating at high levels in a community, then certainly more people are likely to get reinfected in that kind of a situation than if we have uh, something where the virus gets stamped out by vaccination uh, quickly and early on. Um, you know, I think of, of uh, things like polio. We don't spend a lot of our uh, time and energy thinking about getting polio because um, polio has been uh, essentially eliminated from the United States and, and our hemisphere. And, um, and so we don't talk about getting reinfected with polio. We don't think about um, that kind of an issue because polio's not circulating where we are. And um, the, the coronaviruses um, do circulate every year and we do see reinfections every year. And so I think most people think that this is a virus that um, will remain in the human population and will continue to cause trouble for people that don't have immunity. And um, the best way to get that immunity is, is by getting vaccinated. If a person has an uncommon response such as numbness or tingling, in arm of injection and leg of the same side, should they get their second vaccine? I think that would still be a reason, that would not be a reason to not go ahead and get um, your second dose of uh, vaccination. The most um, 
common reason uh, for numbness would be um, actually related to the injection site itself. If you get a lot of inflammation in your arm, you can get um, uh, effects on the nerves locally. Um, I think it is much less common to see uh, numbness and tingling on the uh, in the in the arm and the leg of the same side. And um, your immune response is um, is kind of a whole body response. And so I would not expect that the immune response to the vaccine would cause uh, numbness in one leg and not in the other leg. Um, obviously, uh, numbness and tingling in an arm and a leg on the same side uh, would be a potential symptom of uh, stroke or transient ischemic attack. And so I would uh, encourage people to consider um, getting evaluated if they had uh, those symptoms, uh, whether they were uh, related or unrelated to uh, vaccine in terms of timing. Uh, what are my recommendations when it comes to spending time indoors without masks around other people who've been vaccinated? Does it make a difference if the other person is high risk. So I think this goes back to that Swiss cheese uh, model um, that I showed early in the presentation. Um, and when you're thinking about that model um, and you're thinking about the role of vaccination, um, it probably is more important to think about who the other person is than it is to consider um, uh, sort of who you are if you're the vaccinated person. Um, there has been um, growing evidence um, or support for the idea that the vaccines interrupt transmission, but they probably don't interrupt transmission completely. So that um, if, if I was gonna guess what we'll know about with more certainty um, a year from now than we know now is that I'm guessing that uh, transmission will be reduced by something like uh, three quarters of what it would be without the vaccination. But it, it probably is gonna be um, plus or minus 15% from, from there. So you know, maybe it'll be 90% and it'll be really good, or maybe it'll be more like 60% uh, and not quite as hot as, uh, as it is for protecting you against actual illness or severe illness. And um, so if you think about that and you say, well, um, this person that I want to meet with who's not been vaccinated, um, what, what if there was um, only a 50% protection for me from um, actually getting infected and transmitting the virus? And so um, for most of us in most situations, we probably wouldn't want to assume um, that kind of a risk um, with an unvaccinated person. However, if everybody in a group's been vaccinated, then, then the risk is, is quite low. And I think uh, we can start to look at how we can um, uh, open up the kinds of interactions and the kind of activities we're having with other people. Um, all of that becomes a lot easier in a world where everybody's been vaccinated and therefore the virus is, uh, is quite uncommon and is not uh, circulating widely. Whereas like right now, I think we're still over 50,000 cases a day in the United States. And it probably isn't the time to, um, to dramatically change behaviors when most people have not been vaccinated and we might actually wind up um, uh, promoting some additional spread of the, of the virus. Um, the next question is, does the j, &J vaccine use the same technology for delivery as the traditional flu vaccine? Um, I would say no. Um, the the j, &J vaccine is, a, it's a, um, so adenoviruses are relatively common viruses. And uh, basically uh, what they've done with this vaccine is they've created an adenovirus that can't reproduce itself. And then they've put in the genetic material or the roadmap for creating the spike protein into that, um, that defective virus. So the, the virus um, 
serves as a shuttle to get that um, um, that message into the cell. Um, but most of the flu vaccines are not um, using that same technology. <clears throat> a lot of the flu vaccines are still made in eggs. Um, some of the uh, flu vaccines are now being made in other kinds of systems like um, using um, uh, uh, baculovirus or uh, there are other systems for making the flu vaccine. Um, and some of those are being used to um, develop similar kinds of uh, vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. So um, someday I may be able to answer this question and say, um, yes, the same technology that's being used most commonly for the flu vaccine is being used most commonly for, um, for this coronavirus. But at this point, I, that's not, that wouldn't be accurate. Um, is it safe for an unvaccinated person to spend time indoors uh, without a mask around people who are vaccinated. So again, um, while we don't know this estimate precisely, um, if, if for example, um, you're 95% likely as a vaccinated person not to get sick, that's a really good number. But if you're only 75% um, likely to um, keep from getting an asymptomatic infection, that means that there's basically a one in four chance that you could still have that infection and spread the virus to that, um, that unvaccinated person. Um, and I, I don't know if this question is really about whether the vaccinated or the unvaccinated person is is wearing the mask, but um, if you're that one in four people that gets infected and can shed virus, um, a mask would be expected to reduce the risk that you would transmit that to the other person. And if that other person wears a mask, that would also improve uh, or lower their risk of getting infected. But at 25%, it's not close enough to zero that that would be um, routinely recommended at this point. Um, next question. Have any people died from the vaccine? And if so, do you know how many? Um, so far, we don't have any um, uh, information to suggest that anybody's died from the vaccine. Um, generally, um, the easiest way to see this would be if um, somebody had an anaphylactic or allergic, severe allergic reaction to the vaccine and actually died from their anaphylaxis. My understanding is that although anaphylaxis is occurring on the order of one in 100,000 um, individuals that get the uh, mRNA vaccines, that all of those have been treatable and nobody has died from an anaphylactic reaction to the, uh, to the vaccine. Um, the thing that's a little harder to judge is that um, the vaccine is only good against COVID. The vaccine doesn't protect you from cancer or heart attacks or strokes or um, you know any of the other um, uh, thousands of things that kill people. And so uh, particularly as we've started the vaccination process, starting with our oldest um, individuals, I, I mean, I would be misleading you to say that nobody who's received a vaccine has died in the in the six months or a year after they've gotten vaccinated because it's not, it's not a fountain of youth or an elixir of uh, immortality. It's just a COVID vaccine. And so um, what happens is when people die at whatever period after they've been vaccinated, um, the people who are doing the safety monitoring are basically comparing um, baseline rates of those conditions or in clinical trials, what happens in the placebo group and um, comparing it to those other conditions. And um, so far, those numbers have always appeared to be the same, except for the excess deaths in the placebo group um, from COVID-19. Um, 
My family has expressed concern about long-term side effects that we obviously don't know about yet. You said in your slide that most side effects occur in the first six weeks. Um, so are long-term side effects not a concern for this and most vaccines? Well, so it's always a risk benefit ratio when you're looking at um, long-term side effects from a vaccine. Um, and, you know, if you look at um, that table that I provided at the beginning of the talk, um, you are going to have to have a tremendous number of long-term side effects. Um, if your chance of death from COVID is one in 43, um, you know, we've, we've already had 60 million uh, people vaccinated uh, without identified problems. And so, um, you know, there, there isn't a group uh, of of people who can get COVID and have less than a one in 60 million chance of dying. Um, even, even children are gonna have a higher risk of dying than that. Um, and so um, to me, this is a little bit of, of uh, a situation where you can set your expectations high enough that basically you can talk yourself out of getting any vaccine. So, um, you know, tomorrow, if we found out that there was a one in a hundred million chance of developing Bell's palsy um, a year after you got vaccinated, well, that would be a long-term side effect of the vaccine. But I would argue that you know a one in a million chance of uh, of getting Bell's palsy a year from now is going to be a much smaller risk and a risk worth taking compared to the risk of a quarter of 1% of dying, um, you know, within the, the first month of when you get your COVID infection. Um, so it, it is always possible to theorize that something bad could, could happen eventually, but the reality is something bad is already happening and it's happening frequently. And that is people are getting COVID and ending up hospitalized or in the intensive care unit or dying of their infection. Um, we've had 100 deaths at, um, at Goshen Hospital so far from COVID-19. Um, you know, it's clear to me that there haven't been 100 deaths from this vaccine worldwide. So, um, you know, you can take an individual month of deaths here at our hospital and it's gonna outweigh um, the, the deaths worldwide from the vaccine, e even if you're hypothesizing that there's something, um, you know, six months from now that's that's going to start causing deaths. Uh, there isn't any reason to believe that that would be the case. And quite frankly, if there's something about the spike protein that is causing deaths at six months or a year or two years, then we're likely to start seeing that in people that get COVID because it's the very same spike protein that people are being exposed to when they get the natural infection, um, uh, essentially as, as what people are getting in the vaccine. I mean, these, these, the vaccine spike proteins are meant to mimic that spike protein that is causing the infections that are circulating. So I, um, I don't anticipate that we're gonna have any surprises um, in terms of long-term side effects that are gonna outweigh what you would expect from long-term side effects um, from the virus itself. Um, what research are you coming across on the topic of future chronic autoimmune pathology after vaccination? Um, we really haven't seen any um, autoimmunity following vaccination. Um, and again, if um, the spike protein uh, winds up inducing uh, chronic autoimmune pathology, um, we would expect to be seeing that in folks with natural infection as well. Um, do we have any new information on the likelihood of someone with the vaccine shedding the disease to someone who isn't vaccinated? So I'm assuming that's uh, the question that I was, I already answered about a transmission versus um, getting disease. Because um, you wouldn't you wouldn't shed virus from the vaccine. You would only shed virus if you still got infected from uh, with COVID nineteen after you'd been vaccinated. Um, 
are there any benefits to double masking in public given the number of noses seen in any public venue? Um, so I, I must admit, I have not, I have not gone to um, double masking myself. Um, primarily, I think the benefits of double masking are gonna be accruing to people who, um, who don't have a, a good mask or don't know how to wear it or don't have a good fit for that mask. So I do see any number of people with gaiters or um, just uh, you know chin diapers or whatever you wanna call um, attempts to mask that are not serious attempts at masking. Um, I think if you have a good fit um, to your mask and a reasonable quality mask in terms of a uh, number of layers and material, um, there, personally, I, I doubt there's a huge advantage in double masking, um, but uh, I, you know, if, if I had the choice, I, I probably would recommend eye protection over a second mask, um, but I don't have a problem with, with people double masking. There's, I don't think there's anything wrong with it until you get to the point where you can't breathe through your mask and you're sucking your air in around the mask because you have so many layers uh, in front of your mouth. Uh, do all the vaccines cover all the strains of the virus? So um, there's not a simple answer to that question. It does appear right now that all of the authorized vaccines in the United States provide good protection against the strains of the virus that are circulating in the United States. But there is some suggestion with some of the vaccines and specifically, this would be like the Oxford vaccine uh, trialed in South Africa, that it didn't work as well uh, against that particular variant. So I, I can't promise a uh, uh, this is true now and forever kind of answer to this, but it does suggest that now is really the time to get everybody vaccinated, everybody in the United States at least, so that we have immunity rather than allowing the virus to run rampant and create new variants that might um, actually be more successful at uh, evading the uh, immune response of people. Um, other than providers, do we know the vaccine acceptance rate amongst different colleague groups, clinical versus non-clinical? No, we don't. Um, we are hoping in the next month to get um, more definitive data about what our actual vaccination rate is because we're gonna be able to send a file with all our colleagues' names and um, identifying information to uh, a state information exchange. And they're not gonna give us back identifiable information like, yeah, Dan Nafziger was vaccinated or Dan Nafziger was not, but they will give us back a number to say like 72% of Goshen Health colleagues have been vaccinated. Um, that will again, not be divided by clinical versus non-clinical, but at least it'll give us a better number about vaccinations overall. Next question. So is it true that the J&J vaccine uses a different type of new technology than mRNA? I would say um, uh, yes and no. It is a different type of technology than mRNA, but it's actually an older type of technology that's been used in multiple other vaccines. So it is, it is a platform that's been used in, um, in other vaccination situations, um, whereas the mRNA vaccines really are the the first of their kind to be widely used. Um, is the word COVID a general term that includes COVID-19 as well as influenza A and influenza B? No, um, I, I probably do use COVID and COVID-19 interchangeably. Um, when people are saying COVID, they're really referring to COVID-19. Um, this is from a coronavirus. Um, it's a little bit like HIV and AIDS where the HIV, the virus is SARS-CoV-2 and the disease is AIDS, or in this case, the disease is COVID-19. Um, it's hard for people to understand that kind of weird semantics. And so um, you will he hear people, and I tend to do it, uh, kind of slide into the sloppiness of referring to um, COVID like it's the virus, but it's the disease. Um, and influenza A and B are from influenza viruses and they are separate viruses that are, while their symptoms may be somewhat similar, they are distinct viruses that cause distinct diseases. 
Um, how does the vaccine affect COVID testing? Um, it really doesn't. You can't get a positive test from um, any of the molecular tests for, um, for COVID. Um, depending on what kind of antibody test you use, some of the antibody tests um, detect antibodies to the spike protein and will um, be expected to be positive if you've been vaccinated. And some of the antibody tests are looking at other uh, proteins and are negative even if you've been vaccinated. So I suspect that someday in the not real distant future, we probably will have an antibody test that detects both and it'll in one test and it'll tell you, it looks like you've had COVID or it looks like you've been successfully vaccinated, but uh, we don't have that test yet. Um, is there any concern about not having enough vaccines for every adult in the United States? Um, there is that concern today, but I don't think there's concern about that um, uh, by September of this year. Um, basically, the, the government has purchased enough vaccines to um, vaccinate all the people that are eligible for vaccination. And by the time we get pediatric vaccines, I would expect they would make more vaccine and we'd have enough vaccines for children to get vaccinated if that's approved. So uh, at this point, there is a vaccine shortage. Um, I've heard different estimates, whether it'll be April or May when everybody who wants to get vaccinated will be able to get vaccinated. But I think it's gonna change pretty quickly uh, once we hit a certain tipping point, um, we'll go from people lining up to get vaccinated to um, having uh, lots of vaccine and having to convince the remaining more vaccine hesitant people to go ahead and get vaccinated. Um, if you're vaccinated, can you still get the virus without getting sick and infect other people? Again, I think I've answered that one in terms of uh, my best estimate at this point is that, um, you know, 75% of that asymptomatic infection or infection will go away, but there still will be um, maybe 25% or more of folks that can get asymptomatic infections and potentially spread the virus to other people. I think what we will see though, is even in those situations, um, people will not have as much virus in their nose and they'll be much less likely to um, be super spreaders or to be the source of super spreader events. And so we will see the pandemic continue to wane, even if there are people that can spread the virus there, instead of spreading the virus to five people, they may spread the virus to one person. Um, and so it is still a reason to get um, vaccinated, even if that's a potential issue. It just is one of the reasons we haven't been able to get rid of all our other control measures um, yet. Do you have to wait 90 days to get the vaccine if you've had COVID? If you've had COVID, um, generally you do have uh, 90 days of uh, protection where you're unlikely to get infected again. And so, although you can take the vaccine anytime, um, you can also wait till 90 days after you've been infected to get your vaccine. Um, it appears that the vaccine is safe in people that have had COVID, but as I discussed earlier, you may have a slightly higher risk of having uh, those kind of temporary short-lived vaccine side effects if you've already had COVID, particularly if you just had it. Um, which vaccines do we have and will we have the J&J? Um, right now, we are only vaccinating people with the Pfizer vaccine. That's the one that traditionally has had the ultra cold storage. They've just changed the rules with that so that it doesn't have to be stored as uh, in as dramatically a cold temperature as it had to be previously, um, which will make it easier for other people to use the vaccine. But because it's been so hard to store, um, they've wanted to have that at bigger hospitals and academic medical centers and so forth. And the Moderna vaccine has been in the uh, pharmacies and the um, health departments that haven't had the same kind of freezer storage capabilities uh, that we have here. Um, it's not entirely uh, clear to me yet how the state is planning to roll out the J&J &J vaccine, whether that's going to go to pharmacies or to regular doctor's offices. Um, there is a survey that's being completed today um, for the state health department. The vaccines are just being shipped today. Um, I think they'll be arriving in Indiana tomorrow or Wednesday, something on that order of things. 
And so the state health department will be deciding in the next couple of days how they're gonna distribute those J and J vaccines. Um, as a practical matter, I think it's kind of an ideal vaccine to use in these big immunization events. Like if you have everybody go to Lucas Oil Stadium and get vaccinated, because um, then you don't have to arrange the follow-up for the second dose. Um, you just, you know, or if you have transient populations, if you're vaccinating the homeless or whatever, it's an ideal vaccine for that kind of a setting where you don't have to track people down for the second dose. Um, we are at three o'clock and I think I have reached the, no, I have one more question. I'll try to do this last question and then um, we'll call it, uh, call it a talk. Uh, what's the long-term plan for vaccination for COVID? Will they be, will we be having it done yearly or is it too soon to tell? The uh, easiest answer is it's too soon to tell. Um, I'm thinking that people are likely to have immunity for a year, um, but partly depending on what happens with variants, uh, we may find that uh, there's reason to start vaccinating people at a year. Um, I, I would be surprised if this turns out to be a, you know, a once in a lifetime vaccine but it's too early to say that everybody's gonna to have to get vaccinated every year. The second question is um, about a steroid used to treat asthma. Um, it says, like the Oxford study shows, bunesonide can mitigate multiplication of the virus and allow the immune system to fend off the virus. With that background, our question is, have they considered this as a possible option? What makes the back vaccine better than this to use? Um, Unesonide is a lot safer than what the vaccine could be given we don't know the long-term effects of the vaccine. So again, um, we're not seeing any concerns about long-term effects of this vaccine, um, even with the tens of millions of people that have received it already. Um, that steroid has been um, tried and there is some suggestion that it can modify the course of um, COVID-19, um, th this was uh, tried in a relatively um, small study, and I believe that study was unblinded. And um, it, with unblinded studies, it always raises the question whether um, uh, people's expectations about the medicine or things they do differently once exposed to the medicine um, can alter the outcome between um, the, uh, the medication and not using the medication. So I think we will see um, additional clinical trials with, with that medicine. And I, I would not rule out that it could have some effect. Um, what we've seen with oral steroids so far is that um, a suggestion that if you take them during the first week of illness, when the virus is replicating, it'll ask, actually make you sicker than if you hadn't taken it whereas it does seem to have a benefit and it's one of the primary treatments we have once people start to um, have low oxygen levels and the inflammatory stage of the infection has taken over. Um, there really isn't any reason to believe that um, using a steroid would provide long lasting immunity. So even if, um, well, so at this point we don't really have any uh, information to say that if you get vaccinated today and you start coming down with COVID today, that you will get sicker or less sick than somebody who doesn't have the vaccine. But what we would know is that um, if you took a steroid today, um, th there wouldn't be any reason to believe that that would keep you from getting COVID in a month. Um, and obviously you, you can't be on steroids indefinitely without raising concern about side effects. Um, the next question is, with, will this uh, vaccine ever be mandatory down the road? Um, I think it is um, possible that that would be the case. Uh, <clears throat> the government has said um, people can mandate the vaccine even now, um, but it actually doesn't make a lot of sense to do that when there are limited supplies of vaccine um, when people still um, have safety concerns around the vaccine, even if they aren't um, uh, based on, uh, on data. And um, when we don't really know uh, the duration of, um, of immunity that the vaccine is gonna give you, 
it may be that, um, you know, we will uh, vaccinate the majority of our workforce and uh, people will have uh, immunity indefinitely. And in that case, um, it, it is maybe harder to argue about um, uh, the vaccine needing to be required. And uh, as the safety record uh, becomes even clearer to people, um, I would expect that people would go ahead and get vaccinated and it may not be that um, you even need to require it to have really high levels of, of immunity in the healthcare workforce and in the population in general. But all of that being said, I, I can also imagine that, um, you know, that the vaccine will eventually be licensed and that health systems will eventually require it for their uh, workers because um, they wanna offer a safe place for patients to come and get their care. And, uh, and at some point patients may expect that of their uh, healthcare workers. Will we be able to stop wearing masks or social distancing once we get to our herd immunity goal? I think so. Um, I think what you'll see over time, um, probably in the next month or two, is that the CDC is likely to um, come up with new guidelines for people who've been vaccinated in terms of how they interact with other people who are vaccinated. However, even uh, today, um, the CDC director uh, has expressed concern about um, the, the rates of COVID illness in the United States uh, no longer falling. It appears that the kind of steady decline we've seen since December has kind of flattened out and doesn't seem to be declining anymore. And I think it's like half of the states are now seeing um, some uptick in um, cases. And so while um, we do expect that the vaccines are gonna make a big difference, um, right now, I think we're still on the order of 10 to 20% of Americans have gotten their first dose. And so we don't have anywhere close to herd immunity um, based on um, the vaccines that have been um, given so far. And uh, even if you add in the people that have had COVID-19 already, uh, we're probably not at herd immunity um, anywhere in the country. And so um, I would hope and I would expect that we will see um, uh, some relaxation in all the things we're doing from a non-pharmacologic standpoint um, eventually but uh, it's, it's really early at this point. And that's, um, you know, that kind of goes back to that Swiss cheese model. Everybody wants to sort of say, well, if we have vaccines now, um, we should be able to stop all those other layers of the Swiss cheese. And if the vaccine layer of the cheese doesn't stop every infection, then I don't want to take it. Essentially that sets up an impossible expectation for a vaccine. And, um, and if we, don't accept the vaccine because our standards are that high. You know, we only want a vaccine that's 100% effective at preventing disease and transmission. What we'll end up doing is spending a lot more time wearing masks and doing social distancing than if people went ahead and got vaccinated. Next question or statement. One of my doc friends said he saw where elderly have much more in the way of negative reactions than younger folks. He was surprised I had hardly any symptoms following both my shots. What have you heard? I think the clinical trials are quite clear that older folks have less um, severe symptoms than younger folks. The people that have had the, you know, the, the most common stories of people feeling like they got run over by a truck have been uh, in young people and not in older people. Now, if you, um, if you give this vaccine, to a thousand nursing home residents, you're still gonna see people that have strokes and heart attacks and get diagnosed with cancer. And if you're um, frail enough to die without a vaccine, you're frail enough to die after you've been vaccinated. So if you're talking about the super elderly and super frail, um, clearly some of those people are gonna die in the six months after they receive a vaccination because the vaccine doesn't prevent all kinds of death. Um, just uh, death from COVID-19. So I uh, don't think your doc, your doc's uh, friend's experience with the elderly is um, 
what's been borne out by um, the clinical trials or the experience we've seen since then. The COVID vaccine trials are currently being unblinded as well. So how will we ever know the true long-term efficacy and safety of these vaccines? Well, the safety question isn't really um, necessarily so much related to unblinding at this point, because um, you know if if you uh, if you use the vaccine in a hundred million people or a billion people, um, you are going to be able to see if there's safety signals. Um, uh, from the from the vaccine, in terms of efficacy, um, we will um, still have a sense over time of of um, you know what happens to people who've been vaccinated versus what happens to people who refuse vaccination, um, and so that will give us um, information. Um, in a perfect world. Um, you could leave the placebo group intact in a clinical trial. But when you have a highly safe and effective vaccine, it's unethical not to vaccinate uh, those people um, when they are um, otherwise eligible to be vaccinated. And so um, I don't think all is lost in terms of assessing how the vaccines work um, once the studies uh, become unblinded, but um, it, it's true, you do lose information there. Uh, the next one is pregnant women were excluded from the Pfizer trial. While few men in the trial did become pregnant and are now being followed, the only fetal studies in the mRNA uh, vaccines were in rats. These studies showed a two to 2.3 times fetal loss in the rats that got the vaccine compared to placebo. The FDA didn't publicize these findings. The EMA noted and dismissed them. Um, the CDC now has received dozens of reports of post-vaccination miscarriages, including late term when miscarriage is rare. So why is this not being talked about? Why are pregnant women not being informed of this? Well, so Pfizer is doing a clinical trial in pregnant women that involves about 4,000 um, uh, women is I think the goal for their enrollment. Um, the word from um, uh, leadership at the federal level in the public health community is that there have now been like 10,000 women that have received um, the vaccine during pregnancy. I think the reason that um, well, so there's a couple of reasons with the fetal loss, um, uh, uh, miscarriages are in fact common during pregnancy. And again, even this, um, uh, this notation that there've been um, dozens of reports of, of post-vaccination miscarriages, uh, to me, it would be surprising if there weren't dozens of people who had miscarriages, um, depending on when they got um, vaccinated during pregnancy. Um, the reality is that COVID um, does cause more complications and problems in pregnant women. Pregnant women are more likely to end up in the intensive care unit, require a ventilator support and die from COVID-19 than um, non-pregnant women are. And so um, you don't wanna compare, um, uh, you know, kind of miscarriage, no miscarriage. You wanna compare um, unvaccinated miscarriage versus vaccinated miscarriage. And you wanna compare um, vaccinated against COVID to unvaccinated uh, without COVID, I mean, with COVID um, in terms of outcomes of the mothers. And um, I think in a disease that did not appear to adversely affect pregnant women, um, there would be reason to be much more cautious about using um, the vaccine before additional clinical trials are performed. But the reality is that this is a, it's a bad disease in pregnant women and it's not, um, it's not like comparing it against something that doesn't cause um, significant problems in, uh, uh, in pregnancy.